Welcome to Citizen Science, stories of science we can do together, brought to you by SciStarter. January 21st is Squirrel Appreciation Day, so we are going nuts for squirrels this month here at the SciStarter Podcast. We'll hear from Steve Sullivan at Project Squirrel, Brad Cosentino at Squirrel Mapper, Emma Giles and squirrel-seeking pal Rosie take Squirrel Mapper out for a test drive. Also, amazing squirrel facts, the million acts of science challenge, and sit sci news from around the world. Welcome to 2024. If you, like us, are busily preparing for Squirrel Appreciation Day on January 21st, you've come to the right place. And if you, unlike us, have never heard of Squirrel Appreciation Day, you've also come to the right place. It was launched in 2001 by Christy Hargrove, a wildlife rehabilitator at the Western North Carolina Nature Center, and it's really caught on. So, to prepare you for the big day, I now present 90 seconds of concentrated squirrel information delivered directly to your brain's Squirrel Memory Retention Center, or SMERC. Okay, go. Squirrels are members of the family Sieridae, which also includes chipmunks, groundhogs, prairie dogs, and even marmots, but not squirrel monkeys. There are 279 species in the Sieridae family, in sizes ranging from the tiny African pygmy squirrel, under 5 inches long, to the Bhutan giant flying squirrel of the Himalaya, or the abominable snow squirrel, as I like to call it, up to 4 feet long from nose to bushy tail. Worldwide, there are an estimated 4 to 10 billion squirrels. That's just a rough guess, but I can say authoritatively that they number precisely one squirrelian. A group of squirrels is a scurry, and a baby squirrel is a kit. The eastern gray squirrel can also be jet black, especially in its northern range, maybe because black coloration absorbs more solar energy. Squirrels are famous for burying nuts, but they also forget about 25% of them, which is an important way that trees get planted. If it's being watched, a squirrel will pantomime a nut burial to fool any potential thieves, while secretly hiding the nut in its mouth and taking it to somewhere more private. Eastern gray squirrels have been introduced to cities all over the world and have become a dangerous invasive species that imperils native squirrels. Squirrels are eaten by hawks, owls, foxes, coyotes, and people, but don't eat squirrel brains. They may harbor strange infectious molecules known as prions that cause Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, a fatal brain infection. Finally, in China, police have trained a brigade of six squirrels to sniff out illicit drugs. We'll post a link to the video of the drug-busting squirrels in our info section. Congratulations! You now know more about squirrels than 99% of all humans. And we're just getting started. Brad Cosentino is Associate Professor of Biology at Hobart and William Smith Colleges in Central New York, and he's using the Eastern Gray Squirrel as a model organism for studying the process of evolution. Eastern greys are native to the United States and Canada east of the Mississippi River, but are now found all over the world. Hey Brad, thanks for joining us. Hi Bob, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, let's talk squirrels. So it looks like you've got a few squirrel projects going on. So can you sort of give us the gist of your squirrel research and, and what you're hoping to get from, from helpers? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, squirrels are a fascinating animal. And, um, you know, we're really interested in using squirrels as kind of a, a, a model uh, organism to understand how cities uh, affect the evolution of life. It's really wow. kind of a frontier in biology right now. Uh, thinking about cities as kind of a, a place where interesting biological things can happen. And biologists are increasingly studying cities. I guess it, it makes sense. I mean, if the Galapagos can be, you know, a unique environment where evolution is accelerated, then it seems like cities are kind of like islands too, right? Yeah, I mean, there are these kind of hot spots of, of environmental change, right? I mean, in terms of evolutionary biology, we think about uh, changing environments as something that can cause traits and, and organisms to evolve quite rapidly, uh, more rapidly than we used to think. And um, uh, so you see extreme environmental change in cities. We should see pretty rapid evolution in cities, too. And so it's a really uh, interesting area of research right now. Wow. And so what sorts of uh, traits are you looking at? So uh, with squirrels, we, we use squirrels because, um, at least in eastern gray squirrels, the species that we study, and, and probably one of the most widely known species 
uh, of squirrel in, in the United States, and that's known to people. Yeah, and they're all over, right? They're not just in the east. They're they're all over. They're they're so their native range expands from the east into the to the Midwest a little bit into the Great Basin, and then there are other species of gray squirrels as you move farther west. But eastern gray squirrels have been introduced to cities all over the world. So you can find them on the west coast. You can find them um, in in England, and uh, they're an invasive species actually outside of the of the United States. So yes, they're very widely uh, distributed, and and we study their 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 color, uh, their their coat color. They're they're basically um, they occur in different um, color morphs, and uh, the one that we're really interested in is is melanism. So melanism in in squirrels has in eastern gray squirrels has a really uh, well known genetic basis. It's a single gene that causes variation in kind of this black versus grayish phenotype. And uh, it's so visible to people, it's visible to us, and, and, it, and it varies from place to place. And so we're really interested in understanding how urbanization might affect the way that that coat color evolves in squirrels. Huh. Okay. Now for um, the citizen science aspect of it, what, what are you looking for people to do and what do you hope to learn from it? So if you, you have your camera, get the iNaturalist app, take a photo of a squirrel and upload it to iNaturalist. And, and then um, you can get involved there on our Squirrel Mapper project with um, identifying species. So making sure that we're, we're looking at an eastern gray squirrel. Mm -hmm. And then we take all of those photos uh, from iNaturalist and we move them over to another uh, citizen science portal called uh, Zooniverse. And Zooniverse is really handy for classifying things. And um, we use Zooniverse to have citizen scientists look at all of our images and classify the coat color of, of squirrels. We have at least 10 people look at every image of, of, of a squirrel to get a mm -hmm. sense for, you know, how accurately are we identifying their coat colors. And so take photos of squirrels, go to Zooniverse and, and classify the coat color of squirrels. Uh, and then on our website on squirrelmapper.org, right, the squirrel spotter game is really handy. Uh, we have over 2,000 game plays so far, but we, we're always looking for more. And we have a master's student that's using that data to measure how cryptic these color morphs are in different environments. And um, so those are, those are three really important ways that people can get involved. And they do help us clarify what are the patterns? So how much does melanism in gray squirrels change as you move from the cities into more rural areas? Uh, and then the, you know, something like the squirrel spotter um, a platform, that helps us understand process a little bit. Is, is um, camouflage an important process that might uh, help us understand the patterns of, of morphology in this species? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, anything else that you'd like to add? Oh, uh, just, you know, I, I, I would, thanks so much to all the citizen scientists who, who have contributed. I mean, I think we've had over 20,000 people at iNaturalist can contribute, over 10,000 at Zooniverse, a few thousand gameplays on our Squirrel Spotter. I mean, we really couldn't do this research uh, without the help of, of people uh, getting involved. And we think it's a really neat kind of system uh, that can shed a lot of light about how evolution is happening even in people's own backyards. Mm -hmm. And um, so we just want to get the word out there and, and, and thanks to everybody who, uh, who has been contributing. Great. Thanks, Brad. Thanks so much. And now to show off Squirrel Mapper in action, here's SciStarter's own Emma Giles and Emma Giles' own Rosie, the highly trained squirrel sniffing canine. Are you ready for National Squirrel Day? Rosie sure is. It's on January 21st, Did save the date. It? Did you see it? <laughs> she might be too excited. No! <laughs> Step one, figure out what species live in your area. This little guy snuck up on me and tried to take a peek without us noticing, but not exactly the most sneaky squirrel. I'm not an expert on identifying squirrels, but I have this nice little thing called Seek by iNaturalist, and so I need to double check what type of squirrel this is. So I go onto my Seek app, and then I make sure I'm in the right location and change my species to mammal specifically to make the list smaller. Lucky for me, the second one on the list is Eastern Gray Squirrel, which is exactly what this little guy is. 
And so I have my answer. I take some pictures, some poses, and then I'm ready to move on. Once we finished looking for squirrels, I opened up my iNaturalist app and went to projects. What I'm looking for is squirrel mapper, which I'm not currently a part of, so I have to search for it in the search bar and join. So I hit the join button in the top left. I can see other people's examples of pictures too to just make sure I know what I'm talking about. And then I go back to then create my observation. I've added my three pictures. And now I'm locating the species. I know it's the Eastern Gray Squirrel, so I can just automatically write that in. I'm also going to take some notes as to what I saw in the park. So here I'm writing a group of squirrels, a group of nine squirrels that I counted in the neighborhood park. And they were eating and playing, just doing normal squirrel things. Next, I glanced at GeoPrivacy to make sure it was open. Since I'm not at home, I don't mind. You also don't actually have to select Squirrel Mapper for this one because it's a collection site. So as long as they are identified and corroborated as Eastern Gray Squirrels, they'll be added. So then I'm just double checking that I have the right location. I find the park and then I save that as my observation site. And then I can hit share. Happy National Squirrel Day, everyone. Yes, that was Emma's way of demonstrating that squirrels will indeed bite the hand that feeds them because, I mean, it works so well. Half the time, the person will drop the entire bag of peanuts for them, so it's like pressing the jackpot button. So be careful out there. Now, as a side note, the black morph of the eastern gray squirrel that we just saw uh, is celebrated in many places, especially Marysville, Kansas, which has the black squirrel as its town emblem and has an annual black squirrel festival. Also, Kent State University has the black squirrel as its unofficial school mascot, and the athletic department at Haverford College also has the black squirrel as its team mascot. Not to be outdone, the town of Brevard, North Carolina has a rare population of white squirrels, not albinos, just a rare white morph of the eastern gray squirrel, and each year they have a white squirrel festival. Well, so far we've talked only about the eastern gray squirrel and its variants, but there are many members of the squirrel family, or Cyridae, as you now know, 65 species in North America alone and 279 species worldwide. Now, that includes some that we don't even think of as squirrels, like groundhogs and prairie dogs, chipmunks and marmots, but even if we just limit it to tree squirrels, there are still about 100 species. For many years, the Squirrel Project has been collecting tree squirrel distribution information and conducting squirrel research. Steve Sullivan runs the project. Fundamentally, Project Squirrel is about uh, knowing the distribution of tree squirrels throughout the world, with, of course, specific focus on the United States because that's where we have the greatest number of, of tree squirrels in our urban areas mm -hmm. um, and the greatest diversity of tree squirrels in our urban areas. And... So Project Squirrel collects just what you're seeing, but also importantly, it collects what you're not seeing. So if you live in a neighborhood that has tons of fox squirrels, that's great. We want to know that. If you live in a neighborhood that has zero fox squirrels, that is also really important. So even if you have no squirrels, you could participate in Project Squirrel. In your data are exactly as valuable as somebody who has squirrels. Okay. All right. 
So, um, so I guess you have to know your squirrels to participate in Project Squirrel, right? Well, kind of, yes. Although, um, you know, these days the internet and, and uh, iNaturalist and uh, SciStarter and all of these different programs do such a good job of helping people identify their squirrels, it's actually really easy. Now that said, um, there are three main uh, tree squirrels that we typically see in cities in the United States, and um, and these and two of those squirrels are found in cities around the world too because they've been imported. Uh, the most common being the gray squirrel, which tends to have a white belly and mm -hmm. is overall in the gray spectrum. Uh, sometimes it has a little bit of green. His tail tends to be a little bit frosted with white. Um, and they're relatively small with relatively long ears. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's the fox squirrel that tends to have a rusty belly and tends to be really big and tends to ha and, and has short ears. Uh, sometimes it's called the cat-eared squirrel, especially by real old timers, because it has such okay. short ears. Now, the fox squirrel can vary in color across um, its range. The gray squirrel can even be black. Um, right. But, but, but learning these basic differences, eventually you get to know those squirrels pretty easily. Huh. Okay. Now, how, so how do people get involved with this? Um, how do you get started? Um, quite frankly, the easiest way to do it these days is just to go to SciStarter.org and um, enter your information into that app. And it's a, it's a very short series of questions, mm -hmm. and you can answer those questions just once ever, or you can answer them a couple of times a day, whatever you feel like doing. And every one of those submissions uh, has value because we're gathering submissions from around the world and correlating them with each other. So you may not know it, but chances are your neighbor is also participating in Project Squirrel. Huh. Mm -hmm. And so, so squirrels, they can really make us happy. Uh, they, can, they can sometimes infuriate us as they're digging up our tomatoes and things like that. Um, and I get messages through Project Squirrel all the time of, of people interacting with their squirrels in fun ways. Um, one of the latest crazes is to make squirrel jungle gyms and uh -huh, see how squirrels, yeah. Yeah. how do they problem solve? And it's so cool to see this, this little rodent uh, negotiating obstacles that seem so challenging to us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, great. All right, well, thanks so much for sharing with us. You're welcome. Thanks for your interest in Project Squirrel, and I, I hope everybody will log into SciStarter and, and at least send, send me some of your observations, whether you see squirrels or not. Great. All right. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Bye-bye. So go out and have some quality time with our favorite rodents, the squirrels. You'll find both Squirrel Mapper and Project Squirrel, along with many other squirrel-centric activities at SciStarter.org. Also, coming up in April is Citizen Science Month, and this year we're running a new challenge called A Million Acts of Science. We're hoping to inspire citizen scientists all over the world to step up their data collection activities to post a million science activities that month. And I say, why stop at a million? There are a squirrillion squirrels in the world, and that's about the same number as there are people. So all we need is one science observation per person, and we're there. Of course, not everyone has the ability to participate, so the rest of us might have to contribute two or more. But in any case, if we shoot for a squirrelian, we'll definitely hit our target of a million. And these squirrel projects are a great way to get started. And now, citizen science news from around the world. The Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology has just shared their top bird photos of the past year, culled from their massive collection at Macaulay Library. They feature the work of over 40 photographers collected in five themes including the thrill of the chase, birds in built environments, feeding time, birds never cease to amaze, and rare glimpses. Cornell is a leader in citizen science, especially in ornithology. In other news, ham radio operators are collaborating on a project called HamSci 2024 to study space weather. Solar flares, geomagnetic storms, and other ionospheric disturbances are nuisances to the radio operators, interfering or even shutting down their activities, but their antennas and other equipment can also be used to track and study these phenomena. 
2024 is going to be an exceptionally active year for the Sun because it's approaching solar maximum in its 11-year cycle, and also because there's going to be a total solar eclipse on April 8th. The amateur radio operators are working with NASA scientists and a number of universities and laboratories and will hold a two-day workshop March 22nd and 23rd at Case Western University, I'm sorry, Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. And finally, middle and high school students in the U.S. and the U.K. are monitoring their air quality and learning what steps are required to improve it. In the U.S., Bronx area schools in New York have embarked on the Fordham Regional Environmental Sensor for Healthy Air, or Fresh Air Project, that's an acronym, run by Fordham University. The schools get commercial grade air quality monitors and the students get kits to build their own and collect real-time air quality data both indoors and outdoors. They learn how particulate matter, volatile organics, and other pollutants affect health and they contribute their data to research studies. There's a similar but larger scale effort in the UK where nearly a thousand schools are participating in the Schools Air Quality Monitoring for Health and Education project. They also get air quality monitors for the classrooms and upload their data to a national database while completing activities and experiments. Now, if you're interested in measuring air quality, check out the air casting project at SciStarter.org. There's a link in the show info section. Well, that's it. Oh, no, wait. I almost forgot. Thank you to Feedspot for naming us, SciStarter, as their top citizen science podcast. We are blushing. Thank you. Okay, that's it for this episode. I'm Bob Hershon. Thanks so much for listening and or watching. This podcast is brought to you each month by SciStarter, where you will find thousands, yes, thousands of citizen science projects, events, and tools. It's all at SciStarter.org. That's S-C-I-S-T-A-R-T-E-R dot O-R-G. And thanks so much to you, the listener and the citizen scientist, for getting involved and making a difference. If you have any ideas you want to share with us, things you want to hear on this very podcast, or if you just want to let us know your favorite member of the Sierra D family, get in touch with us at info at SciStarter.org. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.